another Monday night study. Still trying to get everything all organized and everything. We're trying a couple of different things tonight. We're doing, we successfully did a uh, live stream uh, of last week and remembered to record it. So that's a good thing on our Telegram channel. So we're doing that again tonight. So we've got, we already got three people in Telegram watching and we've got a bunch of people on YouTube. So we're doing good. Uh, one of the other things, and I'll just show you real quick. Go ahead and exit out of that. And let's see here. So hopefully this works. So I changed the front page of the BibleFacts.org website uh, to see if this actually works really well. So supposedly, there it goes. It's very delayed for some reason, but hopefully it's really works really well. So I'll go ahead and stop that. And we'll go ahead and start our study for tonight. I also wanted to make mention that this is pretty cool. We have, and it may have changed a little bit, but we have um, 28,975 subscribers on YouTube. So we only need 25 more people to hit the 29,000 mark. And I just want to say thank you to everyone who's subscribed that comes along and, and watches these things and participates in the chat room and those kind of stuff. We thank you very much. Uh, it's good to know that people are interested in the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, basic Bible understanding and going from there. Um, let's see here. So we should be the new instance. And tell me if it glitches or not on the, if, if, you, if you're watching from the um, website itself, tell me if it glitches or freezes or whatever. I had a problem with that this morning, but I realized that I was not on a direct connection. I was on Wi-Fi. So hopefully that's taken care of. So we should be on the BibleFacts.org website, YouTube, the Subsplash app, uh, Facebook and Twitch. So we'll see what happens from there. So last week, what we did is we talked about the uh, curse stone found in Joshua's uh, uh, Joshua's altar and how that proved that we had uh, the exodus from Egypt, which would have been somewhere in the neighborhood of 1500 BC, not 1200 BC, like has been thought of recently. And so just the fact that the the dating, multiple dating methods all point to that is just really cool. Uh, so we have pieces of that. There's more to be translated. And the fact that uh, Exodus cha or, uh, Joshua chapter 8 mentions that Joshua himself wrote, so it'd be with his own hand, uh, on the plaster around the altar in the presence of the sons of Israel. And so what's neat about this is a lot of plaster was found around the altar but it's so old, it's it's uh, impossible to read. And so they took it, put it at a safe space because there's no way to try to read it. Now they're going to try to use the same technology that let us look at the curse tablet on the inside and, and actually got some stuff out of it. So it is a possibility that this fall or sometime next year, we could actually have photos of the Law of Moses as written by Joshua himself. So a photo of a 3,500-year code of conduct when the children of Israel crossed the Jordan. That's just fantastic for that kind of thing to happen. So when we were talking about that, I had mentioned that there were other Egyptian documents that mentions the um, um, exodus from Egypt, but they're thought of as inventions of Christianity, things like that. And the problem is, if you go somewhere and you have a history of the people going all the way back to the original time. And their history shows that we came, there was a guy in a boat with his wife, his three sons and three daughters-in-law and a bunch of animals. And somehow they survived a great flood and that's where we came from. And here's the genealogy. What secular scientists or secular historians, I mean, are gonna say is it's been garbled by Christians because we don't believe that ever happened. So since that's the real history, the only history that is mentioned by them, they're going to simply say that there's a time called prehistory when nobody knows what happened. And they do this kind of stuff all the time. The, the whole idea that you have a written document telling you something and they're guessing something else. So for instance, if you come into my home for some reason and look around and I'm not here, 
but somebody else is here. You can assume they live here and I don't. Uh, you could just simply go look at who legally owns the house. It's public record if you believe in written records and history. Or you could just assume, you know, instead of me being gone at a conference or something, that, you know, I don't own the house. So it's that kind of thing that's going on. Anyway, I mentioned this, and a couple of people right toward the end said, could we get more information about these other scrolls? Uh, what kind of stones were you talking about? What kinds of... Uh, things. So I thought we would do that tonight. And so what we'd had, uh, one of the first books, or actually the first book that I'd wrote, was Ancient Post-Flood History. And what I tried to do is give a real brief synopsis of a pre-flood time, mainly as far as dating goes. And so we've covered this before, that from the time of creation to the flood was 1,656 years, one month, and 17 days according to Genesis and all the other Hebrew documents. But then going from uh, the flood uh, to the Exodus, when you just look at it from uh, the, the history documents, is 700, and we see this here, 792 years. So in 792 years, you're going to have to have the post-flood Egypt be created buildings built, uh, an entire civilization, and then it gets wiped out somehow, if the biblical record is correct. And we actually see this in multiple times. We see there's a, an Egyptian old kingdom. There's an Egyptian, uh, um, I forget what it's called, but uh, there's one more, and then there's a new kingdom. And the first two were destroyed in disasters, and nobody seems to know how or when or anything like that. And if you just read the Egyptian documents, it kind of looks like it goes back 7,000 years B.C. or something like that. And what we didn't realize is that the Egyptians write the records just like they were individual kingdoms. You know, every decade, 10 of them tallies up to be 100 years. But if you've got two groups ruling at the same time, you're going to have 10 decades in a 50-year period. And so that's what we have. We have one ruling from Lower Egypt, one ruling from Upper Egypt. And we've got a lot of documents talking about that. So the Bible, Jasher, um, a lot of other things like that. But what we tried to do in here is to look at the Bible first, get the basic chronology, where they should have went. We were looking at the 16 grandsons of Noah. Actually, let me let me just go back to the beginning here so you can see this. Ancient post-flood history. Um, so what we did is we looked at the source documents, basic chronology, pre-flood history, and then the post-flood histories. And we grouped them into Europe, Africa, and Asia. Okay, And so here's Japheth's descendants, which would be um, Europe. So it'd be these. So we've got Anglo-Saxons in, in England. And there's actually ancient English and Armenian and Britain documents that go all the way back to the guy in the boat. And they tell you which one of the sons came down and their histories. We're not going to look at any of this tonight, but the same thing with Denmark and Norway. And the most ancient, uh, and this is how you can research it on the internet, the most ancient history of any people is called a chronicle. The chronicle is how we got started. You know, so in other words, if this continent or this island was completely uninhabited by man, the first settlers were from Denmark or from wherever. So the Chronicle is going to say in the year whatever, depending on what system they're using, people from Denmark or wherever came here and settled. And here's the original settlement and here's how they grew. And, and then you get into other histories. But the original one is called a Chronicle. So all of these, these places have chronicles, or almost all of them anyway. So France and Germany, uh, Jasher even talks about the beginnings of what we call France. Uh, Georgia, Greece, Ireland, Scotland, Italy, Russia, and ancient Troy. So these are in Europe. And then Shem's descendants, we have the Arab nations, China, India, Iran, uh, Iraq, which is called Babylon, uh, Israel, and the Kurds. Those kind of things. And then we get to Ham's descendants. So that'd be the African nations in general, Canaan, and then Egyptian kingdoms. We broke it up into several chapters. We're going to look at most of 26 to 29, just because of what people were asking about. And then Sodom and Gomorrah, and then the remaining nations. 
So this is what we tried to do. And again, the concept is if you start with a basic chronology, and I don't know, should we have here? So the Genesis is one, and then we talked about the difference between the Hebrew and the Greek and picked one, and origin, some of the church history fathers, um, Joshua. And so you've got these. Here's, here's a bunch of different history books mentioned in the Bible. So we, we look at the book of Jasher specifically, and then other for, forgeries, the Seder Olam for chronology, and then other works. And so we've got Josephus, Dead Sea Scrolls, the Talmud, Antonicene Fathers, and things like that. So we're just trying to find the 16 grandsons of Noah, where they went, and then you go to where they supposedly went, and you look around for history that matches what we're being told and then look at the dates and see what you can come up with so that's basically what we're doing so let me go back here we want to start with uh egypt's old kingdom so all right so let's look at this and and just look at some of these things so basically so here's our chart and previous chapters have described this and tell you how we get some of these things and I'll fill in some of the gaps but if the flood was in 1656 a.m. 1656 years after creation Abraham was born or his time period actually in this case we're looking at Egypt so the time that Abraham went down to Egypt is what we're looking for and that would have been in 2023 that was the famine when he went down to Egypt and then there was a time when Joseph was ruler in Egypt he was sold into slavery. He became the second commander, so to speak, or the, the little pharaoh of the entire country. So that should be in a record somewhere. And that would have been 2228, 228 years later. Okay. And then the exodus from Egypt was in 2448, according to all the texts. So 1656 to 2448 gives us the, the uh, 792 years. So we want to look at Egyptian history on these things, except Egyptian history starts off with 10 kings that were pre-flood. They talk about a flood, different names, different dates, all that kind of stuff, but 10 nonetheless. It's interesting when you look at all the ancient documents that talk about a, a flood, there are 10 ruling kings from the time God or the gods or whatever happened that created everything to a, a major flood that destroyed everything and everything had to start over. And there's always 10 rulers, which matches what Genesis says about from Adam to Noah. So pretty interesting. So basically, uh, this is how we did it. So what we're going to find out is, and if you go through and study this in, in general, the, the first um, founder of the Egyptians, okay, was one of Ham's sons, Mitzrayim. And in, in Hebrew, it's still called Mitzrayim, is the name of Egypt. And so, but we, you know, in our English Bibles just say Egypt. But Mitzrayim founded it. He created a city. It's called Memphis. It was the old capital a long time ago. Now the capital is, I believe, Cairo, unless something's changed. Um, but what's happening is, is you've got a dynasty, another dynasty, and then another dynasty, and then we have the Exodus. But halfway through the first dynasty, there is, and I'll just go ahead and tell you what, what Jasher records of this. There was an Assyrian, and Assyrians are the people from Asher, one of the sons of, of um, Shem. But an Assyrian basically came down to try to, you know, make his fortune, so to speak, winded up creating a, uh, uh, an upper Egypt. So, and this is headquartered anciently in this place called Elephantine. And there's a lot of interesting legends about Elephantine. And we still see it today, but uh, starting at that point, we have the first dynasty, and then his is the second, and then the first dynasty falls, so that would be, a, a, the, there's a reason for the numbers being switched around, but then the third and the fourth, and then the fifth and the sixth, uh, depending on who, who does what. So first, second, third, fourth, and then fifth, and then sixth. So when you do this, all of a sudden, all the dynasties of the old kingdom fit inside of a 792 year time period and we have something that happens at the end of the first the of these five or these six dynasties at the end of the old kingdom something happens and all of egypt is wiped out and nobody knows why 
okay, except that there are documents that tell us what happened. We're going to look at them. So anyway, so this is the concept, and we won't go into too much of it, but it's explained in the book. Anyway, so here's the deal. When we get to that, we have minis founding Egypt called Mitzrayim in Hebrew, and uh, it goes from him to the end of the old kingdom. So for sources of Egyptian of Egypt's old kingdom dynasties, we have several. There's the Temple of Seti in Abydos, Egypt. And this is a, a temple created by a pharaoh that was like, I don't know, up in the 20s, 26th dynasty or something like that. But he creates this temple and carved on the temple walls are the names and the dates of the pharaohs and when they ruled. And just a little bit of detail, that kind of stuff. And so that's interesting. Now, the names are going to be different because it's Egyptian. But we got to find something that connects them to other people. Then we have the Turin papyri. We're going to read part of that in a little bit. And then Egyptian historian Manatheo. And a lot of people today, again, try to say Manatheo is not a really a real Egyptian historian. His documents are just, I don't think anybody really says that it's fake because it's obviously real. But if it's Middle Ages, it could be messed up by Christians. They say the same thing about Josephus, for instance. Josephus will, will say that uh, there was a guy named Jesus Christ, or Yeshua, who was called the Christ, who was crucified by the Romans, and yet sometime after that was found walking among men. You know, and this man, if it's even lawful to call him a man, uh, did this. And now there's a bunch of people that follow his teachings, and they're called Nazarenes because he was from Nazareth. And so just a little quick blurb like that, and then it goes on. Well, obviously, you know, we're talking about back then, everyone knew this guy was crucified, and he's up walking around. Something to that. You need to look at it. And so people that don't want to, the people that reject Messiah are going to say, well, it's obvious that Josephus wrote his book, and somebody somewhere in the Middle Ages put that little blurb in the middle of it. Well, I suppose that's a possibility, but you'd have to prove that. It's really easy to say, well, I don't like this, so I'm going to say in the Middle Ages, somebody added that little sentence. Okay, prove it. That's It's simple. If you think you have evidence, then bring it out. That's fine. Because if it's found out that it was, it still doesn't change anything other than Josephus would not have mentioned Jesus, you know. But it looks like he does. So the same kind of stuff here. The, uh, so Manatheo is the one where we get the basic understanding of the, the uh, 10 pre-flood kings, and then we start over. And we get stuff like um, people talking about how the Pyramid of Cheops has to be at a certain date because there's an Egyptian pharaoh named Cheops, and he was at this certain point in history. There's also a pre-flood Cheops. Okay, and so which Cheops are we talking about? Is it a pre-flood document or monument or a post-flood monument? So it's the same thing with uh, Dozier. There were two of those. So you got to make sure you, you look at the right one. So anyway, so all of these things. Now we'll go down here. Here's a photo of the Temple of Seti in Abydos, Egypt. And you can, I don't know if you can tell this. Let me see if I can bump it up just a little bit. And do this with it here. So I don't know if you can still see that or not, but you can. If you look real careful, you can see Egyptian hieroglyphics on the pillars. And this is just a record of the from the first dynasty of the old kingdom, which happens after the guy in the boat and the flood, all the way up to the twenty something or eighteenth dynasty. We're just interested in the first six, the old kingdom, but all the records are written in stone here. So just to let you know. So that's the old kingdom. And we're talking here about Memphis and Elephantine. And here's the dynasties. So if we have, if we pull the years off of uh, Jasher, uh, Josephus, uh, the Abydos papyri, the uh, Manatheo, stuff like that, and put them together and have two separate dynasties, they do actually mesh very well in a 792-year time period at the end of which we get an exodus. So, And these are the names from, um, from those. I think this is, um, yeah, from the pharaohs. I think we're talking just specifically from the, um, the temple there. So these are the names and the dates of which they would have ruled. 
Uh, and so that's the first dynasty and the second dynasty, or the, those kingdoms. Three, 253 years, 302 years. So anyway, and then we get to third and fourth dynasties, and there, there's their names and reigns. Again, the names are always going to be different. The years of the reign should fit in that 792-year time period. So um, the fifth and sixth dynasties, uh, we come up to um, the, the last one. So Pepe II is the central figure we want to look at. Pepe II is not the pharaoh of the Exodus, if he is the one that's at the end of the Old Kingdom, but he's the father of the pharaoh who's the last pharaoh of the Exodus. So Pepe II is the one mentioned in, in Scripture about he rose up, didn't know uh, Joseph or his brethren, and, and sought the persecution. And Pepe II, we have some interesting information about him. But basically, uh, his son took the empire, and on these documents, it's called Nefakiri the Younger, and that was the one that was destroyed by Moses. And we have some interesting documents to tell us details, but that's basically what happens. People have also asked, uh, what about, um, the since in the Exodus, the firstborn son of everybody died, and the firstborn son is supposed to be the one who takes the throne, the firstborn son of the king. So why didn't the pharaoh of the Exodus die when the firstborns died? Well, he wasn't the firstborn. And what we find out is that Pepe, for whatever reason, had, uh, I think, two or three sons. And in some way or another, they were all messed up. And so it was thought that maybe it was some sort of weird venereal disease, is what some of the scientists are saying, that caused problems. The firstborn son is classified as an idiot. I mean, there was something really wrong, and he was nowhere able to govern a nation. So just out, totally out of the question. The second son was very brilliant, able to govern the nation. But as we'll see in the minute, he had a very weird deformity. So anyway, and then of course he has children, and it talks about the firstborn son of the current pharaoh dying in the plague. And that's actually recorded in here too. And then of course we have the destruction. So anyway, so here's the fifth and the sixth dynasties, the names and the dates they ruled according to that. So it's interesting here, the very last one here, this is the, the pharaoh that should have ruled, and he never did because he died in infancy. Pretty interesting. So here, based on Manatheo's records, as corrected by Jasher, so we're using those, the following chart gives a total number of time with parenthesis in, uh, of those. So here's Memphis and Elephantine, the first, fourth, and sixth dynasties, 253, 274, and 120, 172, rather, and then these, and it adds up. So it's got to fit inside a 792-year time period. So this gives us Memphis, which would be the first one, close to 80 years or so after the flood is when Memphis would have been founded and the Egyptian dynasty comes to life with a king, so the nation of Egypt. And Elephantine lasts 600 and some years, so you can say about 100 or so years into that dynasty is when the second one was created. So really interesting records in that. So let's go ahead and look at this. So uh, first, let me just give you the, the history of this. This is pretty interesting because uh, at first you have Minis, or Mitzrayim, ruling, and he's the first king of the first dynasty in the Old Kingdom, and everything's going along, and then there's, there's other kings coming along. So this person who is an Assyrian who comes down to, and ends up forming the very first empire at Elephantine, so this, uh, this one here, the second dynasty. His name is Rikayan. And the story that's told is really interesting. Uh, and this is out of Jasher. And I think Josephus mentions it also. But basically, he comes down. He tries to fit in. It doesn't work. He notices one peculiar thing about the Egyptians. And for some, some reason in their history or their religion or whatever, they have to bury their dead in a sacred place. So he gets the bright idea. He sends for some other people he knows up in Assyria. So he gets a band of people to come down uh, armed. Okay, And so they're armed with, um, I think it was copper, and they didn't have copper yet in Egypt or something like that. Or maybe they had copper and his was iron. 
anyway, and superior weapons. And all they did was um, encircle, basically, the holy place and wouldn't allow anyone to bury their dead until they first paid to do it, paid a tax. And so this made him a very, very rich man. And once a year, the king would hear the plight of the people, and this would have been a problem, except before that time came, he made a uh, entrance to Pharaoh, gave Pharaoh a lot of money, the stuff that he collected from the people, and befriended Pharaoh and was recognized as a mighty man. But the interesting thing about it and, and the story that's told is that Pharaoh, we're, we're told Pharaoh means Lord of the dead. And we usually have the idea that that's like some weird occult thing. They, he calls up zombies or something like that. But literally, it means taxer of the dead. He was the first guy to actually make dead people pay taxes. And actually, their, their children did for him. But that you can see where that comes from. You can't bury mom and dad in the sacred play. You can't bury them anywhere. you got to bury them over there. And there's guys over there with weapons that won't let you bury them unless you give them a tax. You know, and everybody's upset about it. But that's how he got rich, started the second dynasty at Elephantine, and was accepted as a pharaoh. He was the very first pharaoh or lord of the dead or taxer of the dead. So there's a lot of interesting stories like that. Anyway, so at that point, further then, you have these two sets of dynasties ruling in Egypt at a time. So here's the information we have a little bit about Mitzrayim. Genesis 10, 6 mentions him as being one of the sons of Ham, founding the nation of Egypt. This would make him the first king of the first dynasty of Egypt's old kingdom. And in Egypt, it, in the language, it's usually called minis, and in the old Egyptian records. Um, so let's see here. Both Genesis 10, 13 and Jasher 7, 11 record Mitzrayim's son as a guy named Anam. And that's kind of important. So Anam succeeded the throne. Now, Jasher records that Anam's son is this guy right here. And I'm not sure exactly how to pronounce that coming from that language, but it, it's obviously a derivative of Osiris, or what we call Osiris. So um, On, or on um, and then Osiris from this. So when we talk about Ra or Amun-Ra, Amun-Ra and his son Osiris, they become gods. This is an example of how they were actually kings and queens, and somewhere along the lines, people make a religion out of it. And then later on, when you start mixing pieces of Babylonian, Sumerian, Egyptian, Greek, the legends kind of garble and they get all put together. But we have a record there that there really was a king named Arias. Now, an interesting thing about it in Jasher, it mentions that Amun-Ra and Osiris were kings. They weren't pharaohs. There was no pharaoh yet. So that was pretty interesting. They were just kings. So anyway, so they became the third king. Uh, Osiris became the third king of the first dynasty way, way back. And he'll end up being worshipped as a god. So in time, uh, the first one, Anam, was Amun-Ra. And the second one was Osiris. So uh, ancient Egyptian records. Um, let's see here. We talk about several other people. Let me just go down here. And then again, here's that same chart for that. So uh, Abraham. So when Abraham goes down, uh, the old king apparently had retired, but the father king was still there. Uh, so Amun-Ra and Osiris was ruling. Abraham is the one that met with and talked with and was received by him. The pharaoh of the Egypt when he was uh, there because of the famine would have been Osiris. Genesis 12 records that uh, Abraham moved to Canaan when he was 75 years old. That's the final one. He had actually been there, I think it's the third trip down, but that's when he officially moved. Shortly after his move, there's a severe famine in Canaan. So Abraham goes down to Egypt until the famine is over. Looking at Jasher 13.22, uh, we've got a clear record of Abraham settling in Canaan and then a three-year famine occurring during the years of 2023 and 2026. So that's that famine when he went down to Egypt. So this famine was only 367 years after the flood and 30 years after the fall of the Tower of Babel. 
Um, let's see here. So here's an important point, as we learned in a previous chapter. Uh, Nimrod is a contemporary with both Osiris and Abraham. Nimrod is the fourth generation from Noah. Osiris was fifth generation from Ham. And Abraham was the tenth generation from Noah. So some of these, the, in, in the very first, we, we know that the pre-flood people lived to be around seven to nine hundred years. Right after the flood, if you were born after the flood, you lived to be about 400. The lifespans were cut in half. But then something, and we're, nobody's sure exactly what, probably a more of a collapse of the canopy, but something happened four generations after the flood. And you can see this because everybody's living to four-ish, 410, 420, something like that. And then all of a sudden, boom, everybody's living to 210, 220, something like that. So the lifespans get cut in half again. And from that point, they just slowly come down. Probably cosmic radiation starts getting worse and worse. Abraham lived to be 175. Moses lived to be 120. Uh, uh, Joseph, 110. And so it goes, kind of goes down from there. Um, it gets down to the point that the average person only lived to be around 50 years. Uh, way back when, except for Essenes with their herbal medicine, they continued to stay the 110 to 120 mark, which is a story in and of itself. But anyway, through our modern technology, modern medicine, I guess, and ease of life and inventions and science and everything, we've kind of come back up. Instead of 50s now, we're more like 80-ish, which I'm glad. I'm 56, so I'm glad I'm not about ready to die. Um, so this is what's going on. And then I mentioned Rekayan and that kind of stuff. And that's, I already told you about where the word Pharaoh came from. And Ham is actually deified and uh, called a, um, see if I've got it here. I know it's in here somewhere. Oh, yeah, here it is. Chum, K-H-U-M, uh, deified and worshipped. And apparently, according to this, is actually buried in an underground catacombs under the ancient city of Elephantine. So if you know where that's at and had permission, you could probably go find the tomb. So again, here's another ancient uh, god, which is depicted on a kind of a warped word or something like that. It's Ham, you know, so these guys. Um, so let's see here. So that's basically it for, for that one. And then Joseph being in Egypt. This is another interesting thing. So again, we have the 792 years. Instead of looking at 2023, we're looking a couple hundred years later when Joseph would have went in, uh, been imprisoned, and then become vice regent with Pharaoh. Well, which Pharaoh was it? Can we figure this out? It'd have to be in the old kingdom somewhere between these. So, And incidentally, this the exodus from Egypt would have been, according to these records, and you could it could be off slightly, but it would have been 1478 BC, more or less. So major point is it's 1400s, almost 1500, not 1200s. So that's the main thing we want to look at from last week. So anyway, ancient Egyptian records about the Old Kingdom. So uh, we're looking at the Talmud, uh, the book of Jasher. They both agree for the seven-year famine being in 2035 to 2341. It's a seven-year famine. So when you look at Egyptian records in the Old Kingdom, uh, we see a famine in the time of Pharaoh Dozier of the Third Dynasty. Now, and the uh, Pharaoh of this Pharaoh here of the Fourth Dynasty, again, co-ruling. Um, or ruling at the same time, rather, not co-ruling. Anyway, so this is interesting. And again, there's multiple Dozier. So when you have something talking about Dozier or Cheops or something like that, we got to figure out which one we're actually referring to. So Joseph in 2228, according to Jasher then, and Genesis 2 would have put it right there, uh, interpreted Pharaoh's dream of seven years of plenty and then seven years of famine. So that same year he becomes voice viceroy of Egypt, we're told in Genesis that his name, he's, he's renamed something by Pharaoh, Zaphath Panah. Okay, so this one here. That's in Genesis 41, 45. So Manatheo records a seven-year famine occurred 
in the 18th year of the reign of Dozier. That's pretty interesting. If this seven-year famine is the one that Joseph predicted, the 18th year of Dozier was 2235. Now, we can't say that definitively, but it's the right guy with the right name, and we know the date of the seven-year famine. And it's right smack dab in the middle of that guy who's ruling. So that, that's pretty con con convincing. Here's um, the chart again. Now, this is interesting. A little more information. So this viceroy of Dozier is called a um, Hebrew diviner, predicts a seven-year famine, and, you know, he makes him head of the state or whatever. Now, in, according to Genesis, this is the name, okay? Now, what's interesting is there's another story to this. Viceroy of Dozier was called Imhotep. And you probably remember Imhotep if you've seen the movie The Mummy. Imhotep is the bad guy, the mummy, you know. It's interesting. But according to the Egyptian records, the viceroy of Dozier, who was called Imhotep, designed the step pyramid at Saqqara. And this is a photo of it. Uh, on the rock monument, uh, there's an inscription telling how Pharaoh consulted the wise Imhotep about a seven-year famine. That's written on that in Egyptian hieroglyphics. Now, again, just because it's a seven-year famine doesn't mean it's the one we're looking for. But again, since we have the dates, if you really pay attention to the old chronology, and even give or take a decade or something, it's in that time period. So this um, Imhotep was consulted by the pharaoh on a seven-year famine, uh, in another inscription near the steppe pyramid, the builder is referred to as Zanach. So here is a guy that's connected with Imhotep in a seven-year famine. This is his name. And in Genesis, this is Joseph's name. Now, again, it's different, but it's kind of similar. Again, that's, that could be a coincidence. But when you talk about Dozier being in the right time period, a seven-year famine connected with Imhotep. Imhotep's other name is this. Joseph's other name in Genesis is this. And there's multiple dialects, so who knows? Now, Imhotep's legacy. It gets even better. So we're assuming then Imhotep is the Hebrew guy that predicted a seven-year famine. According to inscriptions, it's in the time of Dozier, which would be in the right time for what Jasher shows as that. So Imhotep's legacy is pretty interesting. Both Imhotep and Joseph lived to be 110 years old. It's because they were the same guy. When Imhotep was 100 years old, 10 years before he died, there's a thing that happens. So his wisdom was tested by new court officials by asking him to create an uh, oasis in the desert. So there's this one place they wanted like a resort. So he engineered a feeder canal from the Nile to this man-made lake, and he created this oasis. That's basically what you do when this was done with heavy stones, and it's still here today. Today, this region is in El Farim. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that, but it's southwest of Cairo, and it still remains, and you can still see the remains of a man-made freshwater lake, and this is its name. Uh, it's fed by a canal stretching from the Nile to that basin. And here's a photo of it. So this is uh, the legacy of Imhotep or Joseph. Now, it gets even better. It's known as Bar Yosef in, in Arabic. So the people that live in the area call it that. That means the Sea of Joseph. This is what's left of what Joseph did when he was 100 years old, before he died 10 years later. Now, of course, he didn't do it, but he engineered it, designed it, and had people do it. So you might be 100 years old, and you might say, I can't even get up and get out of the door without my hips hurting. But you could, you could design something, and you could hand it off to people, uh, this whole concept, <laughs> delegate the authority. But isn't that interesting? So the construction, no, this is so old, nobody knows anything about it other than it's called the Sea of Joseph for some reason. Now, if we plug in the numbers, 
That means it was created somewhere between when he was 100 and 110, because it's before his death. So it was created between 2299 and 2309 AM. So that's pretty significant. So that's part of the history of Abraham in the in Egypt, and this is part of the history of Joseph in Egypt. So now before we end our study tonight, let's look at Moses in Egypt, because that's what everybody's really interested in. Although this is amazing, really. So anyway, so Egypt and the Exodus. So again, 792 time years or 792 years. I need to slow down. And we're getting up to the time of the Exodus. So if this is correct and this comes up and this is when the Exodus occurred, the end of the kingdoms and the numbers all match in this time period, what do we have as far as people and darkness and locusts and you know what, what happened? Well, at this point is the end of the old kingdom. And secular historians will tell you something happened and all of Egypt was obliterated. And we don't know if it was a warring tribe, if it was a plague, it just they just all disappeared. And I think we know where they disappeared to, but anyway. So piece together the following story. So now we're back to Pepe the second, right? And Nefakiri. Now in the book of Jasher, this person is the, the father, and this person is the actual uh, pharaoh of the Exodus. Okay. So Jasher places the Exodus at 2248 a.m. The pharaoh of the Exodus was called Atticum, and he ruled for four years, including a three-year co-ruling with his sick father. So let me ask you this. If he's not, if he's a normal guy, and my dad is ruling and is sick, so I come on to help him, but it's his official deal. So we co-rule for three years. My sick dad dies. Now it's my time to rule, and I rule one year. Why? What happened? Well, the end of the old kingdom, everything obliterated. Well, what happened? Uh, Atticum was, a, according to Jasher, a dwarf. Now, here we have a photo of a 6th dynasty Egyptian dwarf. There's no thing to it, so we don't know if that was the one or not, but it's a dwarf from the Egyptian 6th dynasty. Very interesting. But it gets better. Okay, so he rules. So Atticam ruled for four years, co-ruling with his sick father, which would have been Pepe II. Atticam was a dwarf, so the Hebrews called him Atticam Echuz, what Echuz basically means short. So in other words, they called him Shorty. And this is the thing: everybody, when they have, when they do something evil, you give them an evil nickname. Um, uh, Amraphel, I think we've talked about that before, in Genesis 14, was one of the kings that came against Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, Amraphel is actually Nimrod. If you look at it, he's the leader of Shinar. It had broken up and then re-solidified into four kingdoms, which is interesting according to prophecy. But what's interesting is, think about this, Nimrod creates the empire, the Tower of Babel basically destroys everything, and after that they call him Amraphel. Well, what's Amraphel mean? He who causes his people to fall, or he who caused the Tower of Babel to fall, and the people were scattered. Stupid, Mr. Idiot. Now, you don't call him that to his name because he'll kill you. And you don't call a pharaoh, hey, shorty, because he'll probably kill you. But if he is short, that's what you would call him. I mean, a normal guy is tall. This guy is a child, basically. Now, he's intelligent, and again, the firstborn son was mentally deficient, so he's not on the throne. The firstborn son might die, and I don't know if he did in the Exodus or not, but this guy would not since he's secondborn. So, Atticam was a dwarf. The Hebrews called him Atticam Achaz, because Achaz means short. Atticam's father was called Pharaoh Malol. And he's the one that started the persecutions. And this is according to Jasher, Malol. During the, that means bitterness or persecution. The last 10 years of his life, Malol had leprosy, but still ruled for a total of 94 years. Now, this is important because, again, leprosy, there's something wrong with him. Uh, he's got some weird 
leprosy skin type disease to the point that when he dies, they don't bury him, they burn him. His firstborn son is messed up mentally. His second born son is a dwarf. So that's just weird. But there's something wrong genetically. Um, and again, some people were thinking maybe venereal diseases or something, but something happens anyway. But this is just what Jasher records. And he calls it leprosy or a type of leprosy, white skin type disease. But this is in, the interesting point. He rules for 94 years and then dies. Uh, so uh, that would be from 2353 to 2447, a year or so, well, about a year before the destruction. And then he rules for one year, and then there's an exodus. So Joseph ruled uh, from 2228 to 2309. Thus, Malol would have been the Pharaoh who knew not Joseph. Malol was Pharaoh who started the heavy persecution of the Israelites. Now, this is really interesting, too. I want to show you this. Egyptian records in the Temple of Abydos, remember that temple we started talking about with all, all the stuff written about? Uh, again, let me, let me just to make sure we, we got this right. Um, he rules for 94 years. This is according to the book of Jasher. He rules for 94 years, rules. So he, he was older than 94 because he didn't start ruling when he was one or two. He ruled for 94 years and then died. Then his son rules for one year and there's an exodus or a mass destruction. Now, Egyptian records on the Temple of Abydos, and the Temple of Abydos was discovered in the 1920s by Sir Flanders Petrie, very famous Egyptologist. Anyway, according to that and the Turin papyrus, which we're going to look at here in a minute, and <laughs> the Egyptian historian Manatheo, uh, show that Pharaoh Neferkiri, Pepi II, also called Pheops, and um, I don't know how to pronounce those, but anyway. So this guy was the longest living Pharaoh in the Old Kingdom. Okay, Ruled for 94, according to Jasher. Egyptian documents, all three of them, the longest ruling pharaoh in the old kingdom. So what are the numbers? He became pharaoh, according to the Egyptian records, at the age of six, and he lived until he was 100 years old. Now, 100 minus six is 94. Okay, so Jasher says he lived to be 90, he ruled 94 years. The Egyptian records said he started at six, died at 100, 94 years, oldest person to that point. So his son, then, Neferkiri the Younger, also called those others in the, in the other manuscripts, ruled only one year after his father's death, and that exactly matches what Jasher gives, uh, 2447 to 2448. Now, the last ruler in those texts is, is mentioned as Netokiri, the wife of this guy, the younger. Now, this is a male-dominated society. You will not have a queen, not one ruling, that is, telling uh, men what to do. That's not going to happen unless the men are all dead. But you got an entire army, right? Unless something happened to the army. Gets interesting. So the Hebrews called her Geduda. Okay, with her husband gone and her firstborn son killed in the Great Plague, she was left alone to rule in that male-dominated society. Now, uh, this guy, which had been the Pharaoh of the Exodus, ruled for, uh, or this guy ruled for 14 years, uh, and this is the, the guy in the other kingdom. So this is the southern kingdom and the northern. So he... Uh, there was three years when Pepe the first, and then eleven years with Pepe the second. So they're they're overlapping. He was given uh, when he uh, grew from six to seventeen years of age. Moses was born in twenty three sixty eight A.M. according to Jasher. So the sixth dynasty lasted a total of one hundred seventy four years, and we can pull all that together. But then it gets interesting. This was found recently. This is a famous statue. Let me see if I can get this just right here. Okay, well, anyway, that's okay. So this is a famous statue of an Egyptian dwarf with a normal-sized 
wife and apparently had a son and a daughter. Okay, underneath that. And the inscriptions in Egyptian hieroglyphs are written uh, right here and right here, among other places. But this one it has an inscription saying that this is a dwarf. His name was Seneb. Again, whatever language we're, we're doing or, or subgroup. He was a servant of Pepi II of the 6th dynasty. So we know this guy to be Adachem Ahuz, or the pharaoh of the Exodus that ruled for one year. Very interesting, isn't it? Uh, the rest of this stuff talks about the king who was king at the time when Moses left and the, the chronology of Moses and the Setis and, and that kind of stuff in the 80-year period. Oh, yes. Wanted to show this. Well, and we'll end with these two. This is something I mentioned last time and people were going, the black what? What did you call that thing? It's a granite naos stone. Now, a naos stone is it's a type of stone, and they may look different, but it's a type of stone that you have in a temple. It's dedicated to a god or is a record about a god or it's, it's usually a temple thing. So it's just a special name for a history or a story or something about a religious god or religious king or something like that. And so because of what it is, that's what they call it. So this is called the Black Granite Naos Stone. And it's currently at Isamalia. Now, it was originally found in the city of El Arish, which is at the... At the in, in Israel, in, or I mean, excuse me, in Egypt, rather. Anyway, this stone is now ha housed in a museum in Isamalia, Egypt. And it contains, and it, you can see here some of the inscriptions, but it contains an inscription written in Egyptian hieroglyphics stating how Pharaoh, and we don't know which Pharaoh, just Pharaoh. So again, with it being slightly messed up, uh, I'm assuming it's the last Pharaoh of the Old Kingdom. But Pharaoh's entire army was destroyed in some kind of whirlpool. So they were somewhere on water. Something happened with the water and destroyed the entire Egyptian army somewhere. That, and that's all it says. But again, we're piecing this together, little evidences. So we know the Egyptian army was destroyed when they tried to come after the children of Israel. Now, we'll end with this one. This is the Leiden papyri or Leiden papyri. It's also called the Upperar papyrus, or it's also called the Admonitions of the Egyptian Sage. And again, this has got something to do with plagues back that destroyed the, the sixth dynasty. So again, we're, we're back there. Well, what kind of plagues? What does it say? Um, and this is mentioned in, in greater detail, Emanuel Velikovsky's book, Ages and Chaos. <clears throat> but here's just a few of the points that I did. So in a couple of places, you can see the references here. Uh, there's, a, there's information about water, some water, probably Nile, but water turning into blood. It says literally, plague is everywhere, blood is everywhere. And then it says, he who poured water on the ground... He has captured the strong man in misery. And the river, I'm assuming that would be Nile, that's the main river. The river is blood. Men shrink from tasting it and thirst for water. I don't think this means that they, you know, become midgets or does anything magical, but it's like, ooh, shrinking back from, I'm not going to drink this. I'm, I'm thirsty. I'm not going to drink that. So there's something wrong with the Nile River. It tastes horrible. Even though you're thirsty, you won't drink it. It started by some guy pouring water on the ground, and then all of a sudden, blood and a plague is everywhere, and the river is blood. So, very interesting. Then, it also talks about a plague of hail and fire. Uh, gates, columns, and walls are consumed by fire. So, not little hail things like we think of. There's also a plague of insects. No fruit or herbs are to be found. Grain has perished on every side. There's some sort of a plague of darkness. It says the land is lot, not light, destruction something, and the land is in darkness. And again, that could be metaphorical if it's just a text talking about darkness. But in this context, plague, blood red, Water, horrible water, insects, and some weird darkness. 
that sounds like the Exodus. Okay, death of the firstborn. This is interesting. Men are few. He who places his brother in the ground is everywhere. The offspring of nobility are laid out on the high ground. So even the ones that rule, that have all the special food and everything, firstborn of everyone's dying. Well, this doesn't actually say firstborn, but something about men, they're dying everywhere. Now, the spoiling of Egypt, this is interesting. Gold, blue stone, I don't know what that is exactly, but it's something of value. Gold, blue stone, silver, malachite, carnelian, bronze, and other things are fastened to the necks of female slaves. So the bounty and all the good things of Egypt, especially all the, the expensive jewelry, is around the, the necks of the female slaves. Now, who would the slaves be? Well, the Hebrew women when they left Egypt. Very interesting. And then there's something about a pillar of fire. It says, Behold, there is a fire mounted from on high. Its burning goes forth before the enemies of the land. So there's some sort of a weird pillar of fire, if you take this literally, that actually moves and it travels with the enemies so we can't attack the enemies. Oh, I remember that in the Exodus also. So anyway, this is just a few of the things. And again, not a whole lot of detail, but just enough to show you. So we've got Manatheo. We've got uh, the Temple of Abydos, Egypt. We've got uh, the Black Granite Naos Stone. We've got the Upawar Papyri, and I think those are the only things we talked about. But from them, from Genesis and the book of Jasher, we can pull together a pretty interesting story. And Nefer uh, Pepi II is the next to the last pharaoh of the Old Kingdom. He's the one that had some sort of weird skin disease. His firstborn son was messed up. His secondborn son was the pharaoh of the Exodus that ruled for one year. He was a dwarf. His wife was a normal lady. They all had their names. They called him Shorty. Um, his son died. And they had the slave force that ran off with stuff. Somebody came in and did plagues. This is not an invasion. No, notice this. Nowhere does it say an army came and wiped everybody out. They were wiped out because there's no food, no grain, because there's darkness, there's plague, Everybody's dying, just dying. The slaves are running off with all the gold and the silver. There's this pillar of fire and this guy causing the Nile River to turn to blood. So very interesting. That's just the laden papyrus and then this one. So this has just been a handful of things, hopefully to answer some of your questions. And again, that's what we did with this book is we tried to say, okay, if the, if the Bible's correct, this would have happened about this time. So we go back to those places where it should have happened, try to find records from that time period or somewhere close, and do any of them match the Bible? And when it does, you talk about it. And that's what we did. Again, we this has just been the stuff with Egypt, but I thought it would be interesting because Exodus from Egypt, the Passover is coming up, and what we were talking about last time. So I'll get ahead and stop for tonight. That's just our, our study. And I'm going to go through here and see if there are any questions um, in the chat room. Uh, yeah, I believe so. The Essenes had four festivals, festival of, four, four festivals of first fruits, barley, wheat, wine, and oil. Could there be a prophetic connection to Revelation 6.6? 6? I don't know what it would be, but it sure seems like it is. It seems like it's, I mean, it's obviously talking about there's a famine, so you wouldn't have bread. But then specifically, there's more barley than wheat. And of course, you can have two crops of barley in one year instead of one for wheat. So that would make sense. It would be cheap, cheaper, you know, half price. But hurt not the wine and the oil. Um, yeah, there's something to that, I think. I have no idea what, but those are things that, yeah, we just got to think about them, try to piece them together, and hopefully tomorrow somebody will find another scroll. We live in exciting times.
Okay, everybody's saying hi. Let's see here. Um, question. First Thessalonians 5.5 5 says there's a reference to the, could, could possibly be a reference to our Essene heritage as the body of Christ. It says, for, ye, for you are all children of the day. We are not to walk in darkness, possibly sons of light. Yeah, there's actually other scriptures that talk about us being the sons of light. Um, I think it's in Ephesians. It's another place. So yeah, there's there's things like that in many places. Some of the phrases in 1 John, um, like the uh, spirit of truth versus the spirit of error, are found in the scrolls. And there's just a whole lot of stuff, which makes sense. I mean, that's not saying that we have to follow a scene doctrine or, you know, because um, I might be a Baptist and I don't follow the Pentecostals or the Pente I might be a Pentecostal and I don't follow the Catholics or we all basically have a Jesus and him crucified. But we divide on maybe sometimes very important things, but we divide on secondary type issues. And so they may have also, but the language is the same. They believe the Messiah was God incarnate. He would come to die for our sins. He's supposed to die in 32 A.D., and start the age of grace. And we are the sons of light versus the sons of darkness. So yeah, it's. I think that's one of the references. There's actually quite a bit, I think. Um, I want to get all the translations done and then just go back through the New Testament and plug all that stuff together. I think it'll be fun. Um, a little bit of glitchy lag, but they're in Canada. Okay. And they're watching, looks like, on YouTube. So that's okay. I mean, that's, thank you for letting me know. Um, is the pre-flood hit? Oh, yeah. The, yeah, I should be doing that. Let's see here. When we go to BibleFacts.org home, you click on store. These are all of our books. And the post-flood history book is um, this one here, Ancient Post-Flood History. So you can get it from Amazon. All our stuff's from Amazon. Um, so yeah, it's twelve ninety six paperback. So, so five hundred sixty one ratings with a f okay. So it's got good writings, I guess. Ratings rather. Yeah, published uh, two thousand ten. Wow, that goes back a ways. I've been writing for a while. So yeah, all of the books are on it here, Bible Facts Store. These are all just links to Amazon, so you can get them real easy. I just ordered a bunch today because we're supposed to go to the Prophecy Watchers Conference in May, the weekend of, I think, the 19th. So in Colorado Springs. So it'll be a lot of fun. We'll be talking about that sometime later, too. But yeah, so it's available. Um, Isaiah 11 says the sea of Egypt will be smitten by God. What is this referring to? I think, and I could be wrong, but there's that and a couple of other references talking about God smites it. And I think it's got something to do with the time of uh, the Antichrist. Because it talks about there's an evil king that's been placed in, over them. Uh, the sea of Egypt, which is the Nile River, is destroyed. And... Um, it talks about everything becoming like a muck mire type stuff and no longer supports. So there's, and there's a couple of other scriptures that go along with that, talking about the Nile River being destroyed. And so that's what's always funny when people say, I think we're in the tribulation period. Like, well, I didn't see anything on the news about the Nile being destroyed. And that happens fairly quick, I think, into it. So yeah, I think that's what it's referring to. Un unless, of course, there's two or three different times it happens, and this is one of the others. But if you, if it only happens once, and it's never happened before, the Nile River has always been since the flood anyway, um, and it's basically the same. So it would be pretty interesting to see what happens. Um, Talking about several things here. Uh, on the unforgivable sin, what does it mean to blaspheme the Holy Spirit? I think it means to um, basically deny God. I'd always thought when I was in seminary that we're talking about believing that Jesus is not the Messiah. 
just blaspheming him. And the Holy Spirit is the one that leads you into that. Um, and I'm sure that's part of it. But to understand now that they believe the Messiah was God incarnate. So if you understand angels are not God and, and people are not angels, it's all separate creations. And there's one God and it's the Father, and somehow the Messiah, when he comes, is not going to be the Father, but he's somehow God. And there's the Holy Spirit that speaks to the prophets. So you have these three persons that are the one God, and they didn't try to define it or give it a name like we do, Trinity, but that's what they believed, and that's what they were taught. So coming from that understanding, when you got, well, it's just like today when someone says, my denomination doesn't believe that that's wrong anymore. Basic morality, fornication is okay. Uh, you know, all the other stuff is okay. We, whatever you want to do is fine. Um, and the old one, you don't, you wouldn't find a denomination even 50 years ago saying anything close to anything like that. Uh, so in their time period, you've got Essenes and Phar or Pharisees and Sadducees saying, no, no, that's not what we've taught. This is the correct doctrine. We understand it good now. But all of the old ones said the opposite. So when Jesus comes along and says, if you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, they knew what he was talking about. They know who the Holy Spirit was. And so the Holy Spirit heals. The Holy Spirit guides you into a relationship with the Father. And you can't blaspheme it. If Jesus actually is the Messiah, he is the only way to the Father. And he says he is, but then you need to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. So I think it's still all the same thing. It's just a, a wider understanding of that kind of stuff. But blaspheming the Holy Spirit would be uh, not pretending or not thinking of the Holy Spirit, either denying that he exists, but mainly denying that Jesus is Messiah. It all goes back to Jesus. Um, how soon will your new book be published? I'm working on a couple of them. I get stuck on a translation or something, and then to, to relax, I'll hop on the other one. <clears throat> so I'm working on the, the prophecy one, and I'm working on the translation of the, the last few scrolls that are pretty interesting. Um, and I've stopped to do a few other things now. i got to get ready for the conference. So hopefully the next book will be out this fall, most likely. The Ethiopians have a scroll about Joseph, Mary and Jesus' trip down to Egypt. I actually haven't seen it, but I've heard about it. They say it's written by John at Mary's sister's Salome, okay, who went, went with them to Egypt. Could this be true? It could be. And we have to be real careful with it. Even if it is true and that's an actual copy, it doesn't mean that it hasn't been tampered with through the, through the centuries. You know, so it's it's one of those things we need to get it and look at it. I know a little bit about it, but it's one of those things that's on my list to see if I can get sometime. But um, I'm really trying hard to get these last translations done because I think we only have another year or two, not before the rapture or anything. But I mean, I could be totally wrong and something bad could happen next year or even this year. But it just seems like since we have a couple years before the turn of the, the Jubilee, that will probably have a little bit of a lull. And if we do, more digging will happen. Maybe more scrolls will be found. So I'm trying to get where I have nothing to do. The basic translations are all done. And we're just waiting for another thing. We do know, I mean, if everything goes the way they plan, we'll have the rest of the curse tablet translated by summer or fall. And if it works really well on that plaster, I'm really looking forward to that. And that probably won't even get translated. I mean, there's probably nothing to translate. It's probably Joshua. But there might be something interesting in it. But I'd still want the photos to share with you guys just so I can show you a photo and you know you're looking at a handwritten document written by Joshua himself in the presence of the children of Israel when they put that uh, altar together. So if there's anything like that that comes out of that, that's going to be fantastic. Much like the cursed thing, I think we it's out there, but I mean, there's nothing really to translate, but it just proves Exodus 1500, not 1200. Uh, 
okay, one person said they're having a lot of problems with YouTube. It might be just one of those things. Um, that's where we're trying to do different things. We should have a broadcast on Twitch, on YouTube, and you should be able to go to the website. And right here, there should be... Oh, that scared me because I haven't logged off yet. Okay, just because I refreshed it. But yeah, hopefully that's not happening with everybody. If you are watching on the site or having a problem with this, let me know. But they're saying that there's a problem with YouTube also. Let's go ahead and stop that. There we go. Anyway. Okay, another person said they're having a problem with it too. Yeah, it might just be something up there if you guys are toward the Canadian border or in Canada or something. Ooh, good question. Since it sure sounds like Emotep was Joseph, is there a record where Emotep was buried? Probably is. And it's probably the place where they picked him up and, and took him when they left. So don't know for sure, but that's pretty interesting. Oh, do I have the, I've had part of them, but like I said, the, the um, Upawar papyri is in the um, Velikovsky texts. They're, they're, I think you can get those online for free. The others, I don't have them, but yeah, they, we should be able to get them somewhere. And that's always nice to have a full translation and, and then have a photo of that. That was one of the first books I put together, so I, I didn't actually do a whole lot. I basically showed you stuff, and at the end of the chapter said, this is from this book, that book, and this book. And that's not really a good way to, to quote things. I didn't have any quotes in the book. So, but that's been quite a, quite a bit back. Can you explain the Upawar papyri? It's a, a papyri, uh, it's, it's a, it's called several things because there's different pieces of it, but it's called the Wisdom of the, the Sage, the Upawar papyrus, and the Laden papyrus, because I think it was found in that city. Um, but it basically just talks about a time when Egypt was destroyed, and it mentions like some of those things that we talked about. So, pretty interesting. Have I seen Tim Mahoney's patterns? Yes, I have. It's been a long time, but I know his, his ideas of the dates are really close for that, too. So, again, I think we're all pointing back to a 1500s exodus, more or less than that. And you know, these these records might be off slightly too, but the fact that there are records that they're fairly close um or maybe even exact, but and there's that much detail in them, it's really hard to to say they didn't happen. Um, let's see. Making my way through Ancient Order of Melchizedek. Mind-blowing, and it's really opened my eyes. A blessing. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad you like it. Again, it's amazing. It's the kind of things we would probably figure out when you just study it a little bit. But it's nice to have some other documents say, no, that's that's what it is, and here's more detail. So it's really nice. I'm, I'm really thankful the Lord had these things uh, around. Uh, summary buffering uh, watching in Michigan on YouTube. Yeah, YouTube. Okay. All right. Uh, do you know where we can read the Talmud just for reference? There are some online Talmudic places, but I and I know you can buy it probably like off of Amazon, but it's going to be a really long set of, of volumes. So I don't know off the top of my head, but we should be able to find one. I don't really look at the Talmud much because it's it's uh, Pharisee type stuff, and not that I'm opposed to it, but I just I want to try to finish up the scrolls 
to the best of my ability and then go back and look at the stuff. So I'm kind of going to be behind you in that way. That way. $5 donation. Thank you very much. Today, another $5 donation. Thank you very much. Okay, and then let's see here. Um, oh, another donation. Thank you again very much. Thanks so much for your work. Well, thank you. So, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. The past two weeks, absolutely fascinating information. I doubt I would have heard about it elsewhere if not for your ministry. Really appreciate this. Well, again, thank you very much. And I'm just I'm just trying to share with you the things that I learn and the things that I think are fascinating. And so I, I get really excited about this stuff too. It's it's just amazing. Okay. Question when it comes to writing. How do you know when it is the time to publish what you're writing? I know discernment is a key. I have just really been as soon as I get it done. And I think the Lord has, I mean, looking back, it seems like there are times when I slow way down. I don't mean to. It just kind of happens. Um, I remember I was talking with Tom Horn over at um, Skywatch. And he was saying the best time to publish is like in the fall. So, you get it out there and people can buy it for Christmas gifts and that kind of stuff. And for a marketing standpoint, that makes perfect sense. Um, or in the spring, for some other reason, I forget. But I have just, whenever I get it done, try to get the information out. And I'm blessed to be on Prophecy Watchers, Skywatch TV, and, and other places from time to time. Ah, okay, YouTube is doing great in Ann Arbor. Okay, good. It's just probably a certain thing. The only reason I ask is because I'm trying to figure out if anything. And so if anybody's watching um, on this one, see if it's still glitching or not. That just might be me, but. Yeah, this might be having a, this is a new thing I'm trying. This is from Restream. And um, just trying to see if it works. It looks like it'd be really cool if it does. But if this is just me because I'm the one going out and it's coming back, that's okay. So we'll have to see. Just get rid of it here. Um, not loading on the website too. Okay. Oh, it could be something like that. Stream great in Tennessee. When are you coming to Houston? <laughs> not planning on it anytime soon anyway. YouTube is fine in Oregon. Oh, that's a good question. If the scrolls were found in clay jars and in fragments, wouldn't all the fragments be in the jars? Uh, on those cases, I would assume it would be, unless, of course, something happened to destroy some of them. Um, there were some found in, the, in clay jars, to my understanding. Uh, those should have been preserved much better than the others, but I think others were um, in other places. I think I'm pretty sure some of them were just wrapped up and kind of buried. Do we have a book bundle? At this point, no, we don't have that. I don't really have a way to do that through um, Amazon. So we'll see what happens. We do have it on Kindle and on audiobook and then paperback with um, that. We're thinking about trying to get a, a way to like put everything in Spanish because I've had a few people ask me about that.
having a speed lag problem on YouTube. Okay. YouTube and Telegram okay in New Zealand. Okay. Well, if most of you are having is okay with everything, then we're probably doing fine. It sounds like that there's some little thing up north toward Canada that uh, is having a problem. Oh, someone was asking about that too. Let me go there real quick. Here's our Dead Sea Scroll calendar. And um, let's see. Yeah, clicking on here. Okay, we still got it pointing to 2021, so we'll have to change that. Instead of 21, it should be 22, like this. So I've got the wrong wrong date up there. I'll have to, I'll fix that up when I get off here in a second. Oh, yeah, Passover tomorrow. Yeah, according to this, this is the 4th. So yeah, Passover would be tomorrow. And so we'll We'll try to talk about this a little bit, too. There's been some confusion on this, and I don't completely understand it either. I just know that these dates are, like in the scrolls, it'll mention Tuesday's 14. Now, does that mean that the 14th starts on Monday and ends on Tuesday, or starts on Tuesday and ends on Wednesday? So there's questions like that, but we have to have three days and three nights of unleavened bread before Jesus resurrects on a, su a Sunday. So you can backtrack it and kind of see how it works. And we will do that sometimes here. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. I don't know what I'm thinking about. As far as book bundles, yeah, they have them on Prophecy Watchers. So if you want to do that, they definitely can. And then Skywatch TV, just this last fall, took the last three of my books, bundled them together in one book, um, Ancient Mysteries of the Essenes. I think I have that up here. Oh, I've got that. Lots of. Okay, let me back up here and see what I got. So, store and. Yeah, this one. This is the Ancient Mysteries of the Scenes put out by um, Skywatch TV, Defender Publishing. And so, that this one is these last three put together. So, twice as expensive, but it's got three books. So, that's a pretty good deal, actually. So there's things like that. Okay, let me go ahead and stop there for tonight then, and uh, we will check out other things, and we'll come back next week and uh, continue doing some of this stuff. So thank you all. You guys have a blessed week, and we'll see you next week.